Hello there. Uh, today I'm going to tackle the subject of Bible geography. Uh, geography helps us to understand so much about the biblical content, just like history helps us to understand. And we've been doing a series on history and the background to the Old Testament and the New Testament. And today I'm going to talk about Bible geography because understanding the kind of physical world that the events happened in is very important. Um, and to think in terms of distances, uh, quite often in the Bible we go from one place to another in a verse, but the distance travelled may be vast and um, the travelling time is kind of it, condensed into a few words. But we can understand what's going on, imagine what's going on much better if we can think in terms of the sort of um, terrain they were travelling over um, and the distances and where the places were. And of course, throughout the long period of Old Testament history, particularly 4,000 years, the political geography of the place, uh, the land of Israel, changed enormously from um, almost unsettled right at the beginning, um, through the tribal period and then to the kingdom period, then to the split of the kingdoms and then to the exile into Babylon and all these things, all these different powers rising and falling uh, all help us to understand um, as, we, as we remember these things and we think about these things, um, deeper truths from the Bible as we study this. So I hope you'll bear with me. If you don't like geography, don't worry about it. It's never been my best subject, but it really does give us some greater understanding of what is going on in Scripture. So um, I'm going to be holding up some maps in the hope that that will help you. Um, it's quite difficult. I'm not expert at editing videos and things to put pictures into the videos. So uh, you have to forgive me for my lack of technology. Um, and I'll do my best with the maps that I have here. But can I advise you in your, if you're looking for a new Bible, make sure you buy a Bible that has good maps in the back of it or in it. Or maybe invest in a Bible map book. Um, there are quite a few out there that are useful, um, which show you the different um, focuses in or the different sections of the world map that uh, the story is uh, placed in, the story you happen to be reading. So thinking about the, the world, the biblical world, really went east and west. And if you look at this map here, this is the map of... Egypt is down here, um, here is the Holy Land, what we call the Holy Land, the Mediterranean sea, sea is here, and then we have the empires over to the east, um, stretching right over to Persia over here, and Media and Persia over here, which was a later empire. But that's the map going eastward with the Holy Land, um, the land where all the events of well, most of the events of, of uh, the Old Testament and New Testament happened are here. Um, and then this other map shows us going westward with the Holy Land here on this side of the Mediterranean Sea, just where my fingers are. And then we've got Macedonia, uh, no, um, Asia Minor, Greece. Here is Egypt at the bottom and here is Italy with Rome up here um, and this is the Mediterranean Sea. So this this is much more the New Testament world because the Old Testament world was very focused on what was happening um, to the east of uh, the Holy Land. So this map here now shows you a focus in on uh, what we call the Holy Land or what is known as Palestine now, or where where the focus was. Mediterranean Sea is here. Here is the River Jordan rising in the north, Lake Hula, Sea of Galilee, the River Jordan coming down here through the rift, deep rift valley here to the Dead Sea, and Egypt is down below 
here or below here. Um, so that's a focus in on um, Canaan, what they call Canaan. And there's Mount Carmel where Elijah um, did battle with the prophets of Baal and the altar was built there. So looking at that last map, uh, Palestine or uh, Canaan as it's called there, it was um, west to east only 63 miles or maybe about 100 kilometers in the north, wider in the south 125 miles 200 kilometers across east to west um, and north to south round about 190 miles or 300 kilometers. Um, and that's quite important to remember because when you get out to this side where my hand is, this is desert. So the habitable place, places were in a, a narrow band of land, north to south. So if you can find yourself a map to look at while I'm describing it, that will help me because I won't have to hold the map up for you. <laughs> so at the... Uh, on the coastline, let's think about the coastline of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, north of that outlet of Carmel, Mount Carmel, north of there, there were many harbours, including Tyre and Sidon and other harbours. It was very useful for shipping. And south of Carmel, there were very few harbours. Um, there was mud carried up from the River Nile and the Nile Delta to the coast and... Uh, the artificial harbours soon got silted up that had been built. And then inside from that, there's what's called the Maritime Plain, which is where the Philistines lived. Um, it was fertile, rich soil in, inland from the coast, between the coast and the River Jordan. And then lowlands from the Maritime Plain, building up towards the mountains and then uh, the River Jordan. There were lots of what are called wadis, um, which are valleys that are dry in the summer and can flood very quickly with rainfall. Um, but the wadis um, were often used as roadways when they were dry. So very interesting geography. And then we have the River Jordan running down the centre of the country. I can't decide there's a River Jordan. Yeah, you can see here's the, the plain here and then the rise of the mountains to the yellow higher heights and then a fertile bit and then this down here is very deep here, this this rift valley. I'll talk about that in, in a minute. Um, the River Jordan, its name means the descender. The River Jordan is a rift valley. It's the deepest depression on the whole of the Earth's land surface. There are three springs that feed the Jordan at its source in the north, Banyas, Dan and Hasvani, which is in Lebanon. The springs of Banyas are at what became known as Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus visited with his disciples. So from the source, north of Lake Hula to the Dead Sea is about 75 miles or 120 kilometres, but it meanders a lot. Moves a lot back and covers probably 200 miles rather than just the 75 miles straight if you went straight down, but it moves 322 kilometers. Um, lake Hula, which is marked on this map here, this little lake up here, um, uh, this is mentioned in, in the Old Testament quite a lot, or occasionally, uh, but it no longer exists because the land has been reclaimed for agricultural use. And then between Lake Hula and Lake Galilee, the river covers 10 miles or 16 kilometers and drops 230 feet or 70 meters, um, sorry, plunges from 230 feet or 70 meters above sea level right down to 696 feet or 212 meters below sea level. So in that, period um, between it's it, it really drops very it's very deep it is as I said it is the deepest depression of the land surface of the whole earth it's a very unique river 
Um, the Sea of Galilee. There's lots of names for the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is a New Testament name, really, um, because Galilee was the province named by the Romans when they took over the land. Um, but the Sea of Galilee is also known uh, as the Sea of Chinneroth, um, from the Greek, the, the Hebrew word chinor, which means a harp, because it's harp shaped. It's cha shaped like a lyre. It's also called L Lake Gennesareth, um, after the plain which is just below the lake. It's also known as Lake Tiberius because the Roman town Tiberius was built on its shores in um, celebration of the Emperor Tiberius. Um, the, so the Sea of Galilee is 8 miles wide, 13 kilometres, and 13 miles north-south, um, 20, 21 kilometres. So it's quite a big lake, but you can see, even when you're in the middle, you can see the, the mountains either side. There are very high mountains all around the lake, uh, with the land rising very steeply from the lakeside. And it's very hot at the water surface. It's subject to strong air currents and sudden violent storms, partly because it's below sea level. The seabed, um, the sea, the, the, the lake itself is some 150 uh, feet or 46 metres deep. And there are many underground springs feeding the lake as well as the river. When you go down from Galilee then to the Dead Sea, the Jordan meanders and falls an, eight, an average of nine feet or 2.7 metres every mile or 1.6 kilometres with a very fast current. There were no bridges in the Old Testament period across the Jordan between Galilee and the Dead Sea and but there were 40 unreliable fords to cross the river. So it's quite difficult to cross the River Jordan, especially when it was in flood. In the New Testament times, the only bridge that existed was near Lake Hula in the north. So we've had a look, we've come down here, we've talked about Lake Hula, Sea of Galilee, and then the river dropping down, and then the Dead Sea at the bottom. Um, and it's called, and we're looking now at the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea is called the Salt Sea or the Sea of Arabah and also known as the Eastern Sea. Its water surface is 1,300 feet or 395 metres below sea level, the lowest point on the Earth's surface. At its lowest point, the seabed is 1,422 feet deep or 433 metres deep. There are no fish in the Dead Sea. It is dead. There are no fish. It's four and a half times as salty as the ordinary seas of the world. And 4% to 6% salts in the seawater is, is the normal um, concentration, 4% to 6% in, to make seawater. But in the Dead Sea, it's up to 23 to 25 percent content is salt or salts. Um, and because it's deep below the sea level, it's very hot on the surface of the Dead Sea. And the water there evaporates very quickly, which is one of the reasons why it's so concentrated in its so salt percentage. The Dead Sea is 47 miles long by 6 to 10 miles wide in kilometres, 77 long by about 10 to 14 at different parts of the Dead Sea. There's no outlet of water from this lake and people who go there on tours and visits, they go there and they try to swim in it and you can't swim in it, you float. You float on it or lie on the water. It's quite bizarre. If you've never done it, you never see, do look it up on Google, see people floating on the Dead Sea. It's quite a weird experience, I understand. The plain of Esdrelon, which is um, uh, near Carmel, it's 
It's also known as the Valley of Jezreel, the Valley of Jehoshaphat, the Valley of Decision, the Valley of Megiddon, the Valley of Armageddon. It's between the Mediterranean and the Jordan near, the, near Carmel. Let me just show you that on the map. Here. Here's Carmel. So this section here, it's quite low lying, it's quite flat. The mountains are here and there, and it's quite flat. And behind, be, across here, is this is the p bit I'm talking about, known as the Valley of Armageddon, or the Vale of Decision, the Valley of Jezreel. Um, it's a very vulnerable spot. It's open to the north and south, easy, and it is the site of many of the biblical battles that are recorded. And uh, Israel is known as a corridor. Let me just show you the map, the original map we looked at here. Um, here is, this is the land we've been looking at in detail. And this side of it is quite desert. And from, from these peoples over here, this is desert. Um, now we could cross it in aeroplanes and things, but you couldn't back then. You had to come up round. If you wanted to get to Egypt, you had to come round and come through this little corridor to get to Egypt. And if Egypt wanted to get up to attack any of these people or to travel there, they had to come through this corridor. So Israel is known as a corridor. This was the highway, the main highway through, through Canaan and what became Israel and Judah. And so whoever controlled this bit of land here was in a great deal of power. It was a very important strategic thing for conquering different places, um, Israel being the corridor. So thinking about the geography, we just thought about the geography. So what sort of vegetation, vegetation was there, is there, was there? And this is difficult because modern Judah and Israel, Judea and Israel um, and Palestine, the mo it's changed a great deal with changes in irrigation and changes in um, building things and so on. And in a lot of the battles, many of the trees and forests that used to be in, in the land of Canaan were, were um, cut down and used to make siege works or to uh, to use to attack but in the main the vegetation is either desert or scrubland and dry grassland there were evergreen forests in many parts and there are of course the sand dunes by the coast so just so the the five regions going um, vertically across the land um, you had the coastal plain nearest to the Mediterranean and then next to that was the hill country which were lowland um, which uh, uh, went from the coastal plain up to the hill country mostly wooded and then there was the Jordan Valley a very deep rift valley then there's the eastern hills which were the fertile hills known as the Transjordan section and then the Syrian desert over to the east, making a natural border to the land. So, there were two main roads through the land. The first was known as the Way of the Sea, which follows the coastline, um, coming inland to pass Mount Carmel, and then out again towards the sea, following the coastline right the way down towards Egypt or north towards Syria. And then there was also the thing that the roadway that was known as the King's Highway. Um, it's mentioned in Numbers 2017. It was east of the Jordan, east of the Dead Sea, um, and it ran up as far as, far as Damascus. So uh, it it went. So there was the there was the way of the sea, which went up easily, came in and went up further there. And then the, high, the King's Highway was the other side of the Jordan on the edge of the desert, all the way up to Damascus, which is up there. Damascus is up there. <laughs> From that map. 
So, understanding the area and the changes in political control is very important. The Old Testament and New Testament covers a vast period of time, four and a half thousand years. We need to look at the different periods. Let me just find you. So, we looked at a map that didn't show you anything political. Now here is the same land we were looking at, divided up into tribal areas when the children of Israel first moved into Canaan after they had left Egypt and Moses had led them through the wilderness. They came into the land and they settled the land and all those different colours are areas um, under the control of different tribal groups. So that's quite important when we're looking at things like Joshua and Judges and Ruth and Samuel, uh, one, and two, one Samuel, until we get to the Kingdom period. And then when we get to the Kingdom period, let's find that one. To begin with, the nation is one nation, but then after the split in the kingdoms, when uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam Rehoboam takes control of, the, of 12 tribes in the north and, uh, Re sorry, Jeroboam takes the 12 tribes in the north. Rehoboam is king in the south and the land is split into two between Judah and Israel. So very different map when it comes to uh, the kingdom period. Same geography, of course, same land, but a different, different control. Um, so... So when you're thinking about, oh, there's another one. I need to show you another map. Where is it? Oh, not that one. Oh, yes. Same country, but we are now looking at the Roman provinces, which is where Jesus lived, of course, with Judah, Samaria, Galilee. Yeah, and that's... Uh, Perea and Decapolis. So the whole political geography has changed under the Romans. So it affects our understanding of the map and what happened in these, king, in these different periods. So it's important to know um, what was going on in the political control of different areas as we read the scriptures. So understanding, of course, that in the early Old Testament it talks about cities and kings and there are lots and lots of kings um, and the kings got together in uh, groups to attack Abraham and other people. Um, and we think of a king uh, being over a large area but in the very early Old Testament times they were more like controllers of a large village not a city. Uh, we have an understanding of a city now of being like London or Tokyo or New York, um, huge places, but biblical cities in the early times were not anything like that. They were uh, large villages or, or small towns and the person who ruled that place was known as a king and he was fully in charge, but he didn't control huge, huge swathes of land like um, modern rulers do. Um, so understanding that is very important. So looking at your maps again, when you've got your maps, uh, we have to think in terms of different empires <coughs> taking control over different periods. And as we list them, um, and you think about Israel being that corridor, um, and very often the conflicts in the Old Testament were about who controlled the, the two roads that's, that joined the north and south of the area on land, because seafaring wasn't that reliable in those days. So, biblical empires, you will recognise them all, I'm sure. Egypt, the, the pyramids, Egypt, the pharaohs, they were there at right in the early days and they were there right to the almost to the time of Jesus 
of the Egyptians. The Egyptian, Egyptian Empire was there. And right just before Jesus is born, we have Cleopatra as um, the ruler of Egypt, um, even though she was a descendant of a Greek general. Um, then we, we've got Egypt all the way through, and Egypt keeps trying to control the passageway to, and come through to attack the empires that are over the top of the Fertile Crescent. There's Syria, or the Arameans, um, and they were in power between 1100 BC and 732 BC when Damascus fell to the Assyrians. The Assyrians, the capital of Nineveh, um, they were around from 883 BC to about 612 BC when Nineveh fell to the Babylonians. The Babylonians were around between 626 BC and 539 BC when Babylon fell to Persia. Uh, the Medes and Persians um, from 550 BC to around 331, well, 33, when Alexander the Great came to power and conquered the world. And the Greek Empire, 334 BC to 30 BC, when Rome took Egypt, um, which was at that point a Greek colony. And Rome, starting in about 190 BC and finishing long after the close of the New Testament. And as you see these different empires rise, look at a map and see where they were, see what areas they controlled. Um, let's just have a look at the map. Um, so this one we've looked at before, but you see here's Egypt down here. There's Syria. Syria was taken over by Assyria. Assyria took over Syria and, and then Babylonia took over Assyria and Syria. And then we have the Medes and Persians rising and conquering Babylon. And then, just when you think all of that is over, you get the rise of the Greeks. The Greeks coming from Macedonia and Greece, coming over here, conquering over here, and conquering the other nations over to this side here, conquering Babylon and Egypt, of, uh, Greece, of course. Uh, Alexander the Great got as far as the borders of India in his conquering and then he died very suddenly and then Rome was rising and Rome then takes over and the whole of the Mediterranean coastline becomes controlled by the Romans. So huge changes go on during the time that we have in our Old and New Testaments. So the Fertile Crescent is this, it's called the Fertile Crescent, it is this, this crescent, this here because this is desert here is all desert you couldn't cross here you had to so when Abraham came from Ur which is over here there I think that's Ur he traveled all the way up here to Haran and then down to Canaan to settle and then of course when things were difficult in Canaan he went down to Egypt and then he came back again Travelling vast distances, vast distances. Um, and we're for fortunate that we've got um, the internet now. You can put into the internet what was the distance between Ur and Haran and what was the distance between Haran and Jerusalem or wherever it is. And you'll get an, a, a quick update from the internet as to the distance that was travelled. But remember that they didn't travel the way that we travel. Uh, very few people um, owned a horse. Um, a few people owned a donkey and mostly they would use the donkey just to carry goods. Um, people did own chariots and have horsemen and chariots and riders but they were the, con the commanders or the rulers. It was not commonplace not everyone had a chariot like I mean we these days most of us we all have a car or if we don't have a car we've got a motorbike or we've got a bicycle but these people didn't it was it was feet it was walking walking <laughs> you know those 40 years in the wilderness for the children of Israel they walked it uh, they didn't ride it they walked it so remember that there were no cars no planes no telephones, no satellites, no postal service, 
no balloons, no power boats. If an army moved, it moved on its feet. And the nation, and, the, and, and there were officers in chariots, but they, they would have to wait for their soldiers to, to march with them. Um, so Israel is the corridor or a land bridge. The nation that controlled Israel controlled the whole area. Uh, God chose the most strategic land mass in the ancient world as the place where he was going to do his work. Um, if you want to look up about uh, officers in chariots, you can look at 2 Chronicles 35 verses 20 to 24. And if we look again at an interesting thing, now let's find the right, the right, there it is, the right map. In the Old Testament, there was the, when they first came to the Promised Land, Moses told the people to establish what were called cities of refuge. Now these were cities, there were six of them, um, and they were strategically situated. And, and the reason for this was that if anyone inadvertently killed someone, say you were chopping down a tree and your axe head fell off and it hit someone, they died. Well, you were responsible for the shedding of that blood, even though it was not intentional. Um, and you, the avenger of blood, the person who had the right to claim uh, uh, retribution from you, could do that legally back in those days. But if you were innocent and you had not done it deliberately, you had to go to a city of refuge. And if you were in the city of refuge and the people of the situation, city of refuge had investigated the case and established that you were not, you had not deliberately killed the person who died. They would allow you to stay there, but you had to stay within the city until the current high priest died and was replaced by another one. And then you could go home. You couldn't just go, if you went outside the city of refuge, the avenger of blood could kill you and not be responsible for your blood. The value of the human life was so great in God's eyes that even when you killed someone accidentally, um, you still would face the ultimate penalty un unless you went to a city of refuge and stayed there. Now the cities of refuge, um, there were six of them. Um, there was, so starting up, well, it's quite difficult for me to do this for you, but starting up here, there's Kedesh up here, that's that's number one. Number two is Shechem, which is here, Shechem. And then the third one is Hebron, which is here. So that's one, two, three. That's this side of the Jordan. And we remember we said the Jordan was very difficult to cross. There were no bridges, just a few fords. So you might not be able to reach, if you lived this side of the Jordan, you might not be able to reach a city of refuge here um, and save your life. So the other three were Golan up here, that side there, Golan, Ramoth Gilead, which is here, and Beza, which is here. So there were three this side and three this side, so that you could easily get to a city of refuge if the worst had happened and you'd had, in, you had accidentally killed somebody. So I have always thought the city of refuge, cities of refuge idea was a wonderful thing that God put in place to help people, to help them to understand how important human life was, but also to give a way out um, for people who had not killed deliberately so that they didn't have to die. But they did have to stay inside those cities because this, what they had done was very grave. Now we've lost sight of that in our modern penal system. We've lost sight of the incredible value of human life that God puts on things. Sorry, 
bit of a preach there. <laughs> so now, I've got a bit of homework for you, for you to discover for yourself just how wonderful it is to look at a map and trace what people did and how they did it. If you haven't got a Bible with maps in it, then use the internet and find a map um, of the particular area, whatever that is, and hopefully find a map that has got um, a scale on it. I don't know whether you do metres or kilometres or you do miles. Find one and work out, first of all, how many, how many miles an hour you can walk, right? Um, I think it's something like, um, I don't know, four miles? And I, I don't know, you have to look it up. How many miles can you walk in, a, in, a, in an hour? How many miles can you walk in a day? And how many miles did this person I'm looking at walk or travel to get between the two places that the Bible records and just see how long it took to get from one place to another? And it, it, it'll add a huge depth, trust me, it'll add a huge depth to what, what um, you understand. So, so this is my advice to you, is when you read a passage and it mentions place names, look them up. Don't skim over them, look them up. There are just a few places which we really just don't know really for sure where they were. They no longer exist and they haven't been found by archaeologists, but that's rare. Most of the places in the Bible, we know where they were and they'll be marked on a map somewhere. So if you're reading a passage and it mentions a place, look it up. Second thing is, make sure you've got a scale to work out the distances. If there's no scale on the map, just put it into Google or into your search engine. How many miles between Jerusalem and Jericho, or whatever it is. Yeah, and, and then work out how long it would take Think about how they would have travelled, because mostly it would have been by foot, donkey, very rarely by a camel, or in a sailing boat. No motorised boats, just a sailing boat. No diesel engines, no coal-fired anything. No. Very. It wouldn't be a row, rowing boat, it would be a sailing boat. Think about the terrain of the area. As you look at the map, was it hilly? Was it desert? Was it flat? Was it rugged? And try to place the passage you're talking about in its historical period. Was this happening when the Assyrians were in power? Was this happening when Rome was in power? When was it happening? And imagine the journey. Suppose you've discovered that it was a thousand miles they travelled. Well, how many days or weeks would it have taken to travel that distance? Think about it. Spend time thinking about these details. Um, imagine the walking, the overnight stays in different places, the dust, the tiredness, and the commitment of some of these people who moved huge distances because God told them to. So I'm going to give you a little bit of homework. Um, one I will explain because it's not easily explained in in the um, in in the scriptures, <clears throat> but the others, I just like you to look them up and see what you find. So the first one, first study is to read one Kings chapter seventeen to nineteen. That's three chapters, um, one Kings seventeen to nineteen and make a list of all the places that Elijah travelled to. How far did he travel in total? And how far did he travel on each of these journeys mentioned in that, those two, three chapters? How long would it have taken him on foot for each journey? When he ran, and he did run, how far did he run? And has looking at the geography of these chapters changed your understanding of the life of Elijah? 
So that's study number one. Study number two, look at Acts chapter 10. Think of, you're in a different place now. You're now under the Romans. You're now in Judea. Look at chapter 10 of Acts and read it. Where are the places on the map? What are the distances between the places mentioned in chapter 10 of Acts? How long did it take to travel from one place to another each time somebody moved in that chapter? Study number three, Acts chapter eight. Look at the places that Philip traveled to. Where did he leave from? Where did he arrive at? How long would he have, ta have, have, he have taken traveling? And then, how far did Philip go to meet the Ethiopian eunuch? Study number four. This is Matthew chapter 16, verse five, and chapter 16, verse 13. Where, where are these places on the map? Where is Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi in relation to the Sea of Galilee? How far did Jesus take his disciples to go to Caesarea Philippi? How long would it have taken them to get there? And then ask the question, why did Jesus go outside of the Jewish territory to Caesarea Philippi to ask the question, who do men say that I am? Why did he go there? Why didn't he just ask them on the shores of Lake Galilee? And I will explain this to you because to me this is one of the most wonderful things and actually I did go to Israel in the 1990s and I did go on a trip up to Caesarea Philippi and it's surprisingly far even in a coach from Galilee to Caesarea Philippi let alone if you were walking and Caesarea Philippi is one of the three sources of the River Jordan it's a beautiful valley with high mountains all around and the, the river comes from the mountain there. And all the way around, in little alcoves and, and um, grottos in the rocks, are the remains of statues. And back in the time of Jesus, all these little alcoves were dedicated to different gods and goddesses, different deities, all round. And I believe Jesus took his disciples up to Caesarea Philippi to say, in the presence of all these deities, all these gods and goddesses, who am I? Who do men say that I am? And who do you say that I am? And in the face of all the gods and goddesses, all the religions in this world, who is Jesus? And he took them on that long walk, showed them this incredible place of worship and they acknowledged who he was you are the Christ the son of the living God you are better than all of these greater than all of these so when I saw it it, it really brought the, the the story to life that Jesus deliberately took them on this long long walk to ask them the most profound question we ever have to face Study number five, follow Paul's journeys on maps. There are a lot of maps that depict the three missionary journeys of Paul and then his final um, journey by boat from Caesarea right the way up to Rome. And, and so as you look at those maps and you see the distances and you see the places that he went to, look at the distances he travelled. Look whether he went by boat or he went on land. What were the distances he travelled? How long did it take him to get from this place to that place? How many hours did he spend on the road going places to tell them about Jesus? Try to understand and get behind what it meant for Paul to travel like that. And how many miles did each of the missionary journeys 
cover. Missionary Journey 1, 2 and 3. They're all from the Acts. Uh, they're in order in Acts and they start Acts chapter 13 with the first missionary journey and uh, you can trace it through there. Uh, but do it on a map. You don't have to read all the chapters. But do it on a map because the places are marked and you can see clearly the distances he travelled. And the final um, study um, uh, is Genesis 11, verses 31 to 13, verse 18, tracing the journeyings of Abraham. How far did he travel? How long did it take him to travel the distances that he travelled in obedience to God, not knowing where he was going to go? So I hope you've enjoyed this uh, brief, well, it's not brief, we've done 45 minutes, this, this talk about Bible geography. And I hope that as you explore these examples that I've laid out, that you will never again read a passage of scripture which has place names in it and journeys in it and not want to look at a map and see where they went, how long it took them, and... Uh, and, and the kind of places that they went to. We use our imagination. We need to ask questions of the scriptures. And the more we ask questions of the scriptures and we explore and we study, the more we gain from reading our Bibles. Get a Bible with decent maps in it or get a map book with the, the, the biblical maps in. There's loads of them around. I hope you've enjoyed it. God bless you. Uh, and I'll see you in the next video.